we, uh, we get up there, we get up there, there's a group leaving in the morning, and they are uh, already going to have, when we get there, it'll be about uh, 1 o'clock on Saturday, and they're planning on having fish, yeah. french fries, hush puppies, coleslaw, corn on the cob, and banana pudding. It's all low carbs. <laughs> but uh, pray for us that the Lord uh, give us just a long haul from here to n north of North Bay, Canada, over into Quebec. I'll have to go to Captain Goose and be nothing to think of you. <laughs> well, amen. I guarantee you, you'll never get nothing at Captain D's like we get. I, I, I'll guarantee that, but uh, but Lord's willing, when I get back, uh, we started, I told you Sunday morning that uh, uh, we were going to spend a good amount of time in the four Gospels yes. of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you believe if you fell in love with someone, it'd change your life? Well, when you got married and fell in love, didn't it, didn't it do nothing for you? <laughs> uh, I hope it did. <laughs> but, uh, but we uh, uh, just finished a message on I am the door. Yeah. Aren't you glad there's a door that leads into a wonderful life? Yeah. There's a door you can go through that'll lead into a wonderful life. And then that Sunday evening, Lord's willing, uh, be preaching on Enoch. I call him Enoch. You might call him Enoch. I call him Enoch. Walking by faith. Man, I tell you, God's blessed me in the preparation, but last night, I, I, uh, when I get back, I'm going to have uh, uh, this to give every member of the church. Last night, I walked under the tent fairly early in Bristol, and Dr. Clarence Sexton's wife was sitting there, and she and I sit there and talk for a good while. Now, you talk about a woman can talk. She can talk. And we sit there, and the thing about what she loved to talk about was the things of the Lord and getting people saved. And she said, I give this out everywhere I go. And I said, I'm going to use this and how powerful it is. No one came to tell me. No one came to tell me Christ died on Calvary that the debt of sin of all mankind he paid to set me free. Someone should have told me I was a sinner before the cross, that without Christ, the Son of God, I was eternally lost. Anyone should have told me Christ would save me from my sin, that I must bow before him, repent, believe his word, trust in him. All saved could have sent the message, salvation and pardon are free. To spread the glorious message, Christ died for all like me. No one came to tell me of this awful place I am in, that hell has anguish far untold than any pleasure of sin. Who could have come and told me God's word is forever true? Oh, could have... Oh, who could have come and told me, I wonder, was it you? Was it you? I think everybody, every Christian ought to have that and have it in the front of their Bible, open it up and read it every day. And to realize, where would you have been if somebody hadn't come and told you? Amen. All right, this, uh, if our men have come, we'll uh, receive the offering we're uh, still raising the funds to uh, take care of Scott's uh, trip with us to Israel. We need about eighteen hundred dollars more, so we need to uh, we need to do our best. And I believe you'll be blessed. I tell you, talk about the greatest gift you could ever give a preacher. Just let him go over and see uh, the land that our Lord walked in. Let's look the Lord in prayer, Brother Jack. Would you pray for us?
Amen. Amen. I invite you to keep your Bible tonight and let's turn to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Boy, I'm going to tell you, Dr. Sexton last night, I believe, brought one of the most powerful messages for this hour. He preached from Romans chapter 1 last night. And uh, God describes what happens to man when man turns away from God and all. But he said, why are we there? And he said, the problem sits under this tent tonight. The problem sits under the tent tonight. We want to blame everybody in the world except our own self. We want to see everybody else's failures, but it's pretty hard to see where we fail. Now, boy, what a powerful message he preached last night. I'm telling you, it was powerful. Romans 13, 14 verses. I'm going to try to speed up some because I want to go to the book of James. <laughs> Whew, I tell you, I got in this book of James, and I tell you, it's got some tough medicine in it. But it got some medicine to help you, though. Amen. Book of James. Chapter 13 is continuing dealing with our, our Christian behavior, our Christian conduct. And he's going to talk to us about, in verses 1 through 7, about our relationship, about our government, about the government or the state. And let's read the first seven verses. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God, the powers that be ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thy shall have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God, to thee for good. But if I do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, you much need be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pray, pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually unto this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues tribute or taxes to whom uh, taxes is due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, 
honor to whom honor. Shall we pray? Father, we know these are some verses that theologians have discussed and people in the church has argued about and debated about for all of the time of the church. I pray tonight, Lord, that you would Help us tonight in this class tonight to rightly divide and discern the truths that you've got to say to us about our responsibility to our government. I pray tonight, Lord, that you would help us to realize what a powerful truth this is. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. How many of you... Find yourself many times lambasting your government. Be honest. Be honest in church tonight. Yes, you mean the rest of you people have never criticized your government? <laughs> You're, the rest of you people sit here tonight and tell me you never have, you never have had a negative thing to say about Washington. I, I asked you tonight how many of you have had a critical word about your government. I think if we keep on, most of you have conscience sake and get convicted (laughs) tonight and raise your hand. Have you ever really stopped and thought about government? Have you ever really stopped and thought about the state and the authority that is over you? I tell you what, every one of us in America, and I'm going to tell you something. Every person sitting in here tonight has lived in a blessed time in this country. We've not went through a world war. We've not went through a depression. We've not went through a lot of things. We didn't have to go through the Revolutionary War to fight for the freedom that we've got. There's a lot of things that that we have not went through that was in the past that our, our forefathers went through to establish the government and all that we've got in this country called the United States of America. Now, Government is important. God in these verses here says, government has what? Authority. And we've got accountability to what? Authority. You know what most of us, if we don't watch it, we rebel against authority. What does young people, when they start growing, getting up, what, what, what will they stop doing? start doing? They'll start rebelling against authority. If you don't watch it, many times in church, people in the church will start rebelling against the leadership and the authority in the church. And if you don't watch it, we'll start rebelling against the authority of the government that is over us. I believe we have been blessed beyond measure in this country because of the government that has been established in the United States of America. How many of you would like to go to China tonight and live? Any of you? Any of you like to go to Russia tonight and live? How about going to Pakistan tonight? How about going to Afghanistan? You said, no, I don't want to go. Hey, did it ever occur to you much of the world doesn't have freedom of speech? Did it ever occur to you much of the world does not have freedom of religion? How many of you know there's many and multitudes of Christians meeting all over this world, but you know where they're meeting? Let me give you something to think about. How many of you just love to think? That's what I thought. Let me give you something to think about. If the Lord doesn't come back, and you're here 10 years from now, and things keep going at the rate they're going right now, where do you think the church in America is going to be? Same place it is in China and Russia and many other places. It's going to be the underground church. You're going to find yourself, if you're worshiping the true and the living God, as we do even here tonight, you're going to find yourself going into places of secret to worship. Now, we ought to be thankful for this Republic, the United States of America, that has given us the great freedom that we have. Paul wrote to young Timothy, and what did he tell Timothy we ought to do for those 
in authority over us. How many of you know what he said to do? Pray for them. Pray for all of those. By the way, I think that even starts with your mayor and city council, your governor, your house of representatives and senate and your state, your president, your, your house of representatives, uh, federal house of representatives and, and senators and all. How many of you believe America might be a little better off tonight if we would pray for our leaders as much as maybe we criticize them? Now, Pat did bring my hearing aids a while ago. I've got them in. Huh? How many of you know sometimes it gets down to the street where we live and we are good about condemning, but we are slow about what? Praying and exalting them and lifting them up. How many of you believe God can change the hearts of people? How many of you believe God can interfere God, is, God said, I raise a king up. A king cannot rise up, and a king cannot fall without what? Me. Amen. And how many of you believe if we down at the church house and God's people really got to this thing of believing, faith, we talk about faith a lot, don't we? Do we have faith to believe that God can touch our leaders and touch our government? See, Government is to be obeyed. Amen? Government, you say, well, I tell you what, I'm sick and tired of government. Let's just get rid of it. All right, get rid of government. What are you going to have? You're going to have anarchy. How many of you would love to be living in this city tonight without any rules, laws, or regulations? Now, just stop thinking about If there were no law or no authority in this city and, and, and everybody did everything that was right in their own eyes, how many of you can understand walking out those doors into a chaotic world? What's government there? Government there is for authority to hold what? Things together. And God teaches in these verses that we're to obey government. And by the way, let me just ask you a question. Who established government? God ordained it. Would you say that God ordained government just as much as God ordained the church and the family? Yes. God ordained three institutions. What are they? The family, government, and the church. That's the three institutions that God ordained. Now, by the way, God never intended for the church to not be involved in government. Let me say it to you one more time. God never intended for the government to not be influenced by the church. Let me ask you something. Who was some of our, our early leaders in this young republic? Were Christians. Hamilton. You know, Jefferson, I do not believe Jefferson was a real Christian. Thomas Jefferson, he was a deist. But you know something, Thomas Jefferson, he had a great respect for this book. He read this book continually, the Word of God, the Bible, but he was a deist. But he had great respect for Christians and for the authority uh, of, of God's Word. What about Hamilton? What about even our first, I, I know secular history likes to try to rewrite history and tries to make George Washington look like a, a heathen and all, but I'm going to tell you something, you're, you're to sometime uh, sit down and, and read some of the writings that, uh, and prayers and all. Abraham Lincoln, I, I'm telling you, we, we've got Adam, man, they, these were some of these men uh, and back there that that were, that were devout Christians that, uh, that, that loved the Lord and, and the things of, uh, of God. But, but see, would you say probably today our government is in a mess because we didn't elect good men? You say, well, we elected them some good men, and they went there and got corrupt. If they'd have been good men, I, I mean, listen, if they'd have really been steadfast, right convictions, 
they'd have went to Washington and they wouldn't have let the green stuff buy them. That's the danger in government that it becomes what? Corrupt. Corrupt. What happened to the Roman Empire? We're reading in the Bible in Romans chapter number 12 who and what was the government in this day? The Roman government. How many of you know anything about the Roman government? It was set up and they had a lot of freedom in the Roman government until the latter time when they come in and really Nero then became a dictator. And what did Nero eventually do? The man that wrote what we wrote tonight, read tonight, who beheaded him? Nero. The government. And what I'm saying, government is corrupt because the church felt like we're not supposed to be involved. And, and I believe, hey, listen, one of the reasons that we have corrupt government in Washington is Christians stayed home and didn't go to the polls and vote. Oh, me or amen. 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 Listen, he goes on in verse 2 and he says, resistance to the law equals resistance to God's institution. Who instituted government? And when rebellion is against government, who ultimately is a rebellion against. How many of you believe we all have a responsibility to government? And we need to get involved again. How can we turn this thing around? As Dr. Sexton said last night, if we become separated from God, uh, from the world, get right with God, be the holy people God saved us to be, and get involved in the, in, in the affairs of this world, I don't know when the Lord's coming back. Do you? I love what he said last night. He said, most people is looking for the rapture as an escape instead of looking to stay here to change it for God's glory. And I have to agree. Lord, come, get me out of this mess. Instead of, Lord, God, armor me and fill me up to turn me loose on this mess. Don't sit there and look at me bump-eyed tonight. We're all either the answer or the problem. I want to be the answer, don't you? Hey, listen. He said, resistance will be what? Judged. Look at the last part. He said, that resist shall receive to themselves what? Judgment. Judgment. Look at verse 3. Government is established to promote good and restrain what? Evil. I don't know about you. I sure don't like what I see in our government going where it's going. Hey, but we've got to get involved. Have you ever heard this saying, bad men rule because what? Good men stand back and do what? Do nothing. Amen? Hey, rulers are established to restrain the, uh, the evil and bring out the what? And by the way, if you don't have good government, what are you going to have? Bad, corrupt government. Look at verse number four. For he is the minister of God. For thee for good, but if thou do that which is evil... Be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Rulers are the servant of God for good to maintain the welfare of the citizens. Let me ask you something. What kind of government did Israel have before they got a king? Did God ever, did God intend for them to have a king? And they kept hollering to God, God, give us a king, give us a king, give us a king. And by the way, have you, have you know, they had very few good kings. Most of them were bad and evil. But they weren't satisfied with the government that God had them for. And, and by the way, sometimes... 
Don't wish for things because you might get worse than what you already have. Hey, look at verse number 5. Rulers are to be obeyed by believers. Hey, by the way, how many of you know the policeman is to be obeyed? I'm going to tell you something. I believe 99.9% of the time, if you'll respect the law, you'll, you'll get first. And I know there's some out there that's corrupt in the law enforcement and all, but I'm going to tell you something. I found out a long time ago, if a highway patrolman pulls you over for speeding, best thing you can do is humble yourself instead of being a smart man. Amen. Some of you have been a smart man and you found out he could put more down. He could start walking around the car. You got a tail light out. You got this out. You got that out. He can start finding a whole lot of stuff wrong if he really wants to. Look at verse number seven. Believers are to pay what? Taxes. How many of you just get excited when it's time to pay your taxes? Listen, listen. Jesus said to the, hey, render unto Caesar that that is what? And by the way, there was a day that Jesus was to pay taxes. And what did he tell Peter to do? Go down there and get that fish. And open that fish's mouth, and you'll find the what? <laughs> to go pay your what? Taxes. Now, we might not like to pay taxes, but okay, go back again. Let's just stop paying taxes. How many of you like to drive on good roads? All right, just stop paying taxes and see what kind of roads you drive on. Huh? We all like to have nice lakes to go out and fish on. Just stop paying taxes and see what you got. Just stop paying taxes and see a lot about how that your world and your surroundings are. Boy, it really got us excited tonight and really, really moved on us, didn't it? Believers are to pay taxes. Whatever is due, you know, uh, uh, to give it and give it to the glory of God. And, uh, and uh, I, I, I honestly believe the government are the biggest wasters of, of money in the world. I will, I will just speak the truth, what I believe. I'm, I, I just said a while ago, you ought not be critical in the wrong way, but you ought to have constructive criticism about matters too. Would you not say so? You know, uh, who was it uh, back in the Reagan era? Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher said, uh, you know, uh, uh, it doesn't bother people to spend other people's money. You know, uh, you know but, uh, but if, it, if they could just understand conservatism. And by the way, uh, you ought to have wisdom about money. If your out goes more than your income, eventually it's going to be your what? It's going to be your downfall. Now look at what he jumps into in verse number 8. We're still thinking about our conduct, our conduct before the go to the government, now, we're talking about our behavior and our conduct to our fellow citizens. Look what he says in verse 8 through 10. Oh, no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 
Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the what? The law. Listen, what he starts out in verse number 8, and he says, Oh, no man what? What does that mean? Does that mean I'm never supposed to go borrow money to pay it back? Yeah, pay it on time too. No. Does that mean that you're never supposed to go make a mortgage or buy a car and have payments? Did you ever stop and think about it like this? Oh, no man, anything. If you borrowed your neighbor's lawnmower, how about taking it back? If you borrowed a cup of sugar from your neighbor, how about taking it back? By the way, little things. If we would listen to little things, our lives would be greater blessed. If I come back to Jack and I say, Jack, I want to borrow you a dollar. No, I just I don't know. I'm not borrowing. I borrow you a dollar. What should I do? I should give it back. If I come back and say, Jack, give me a dollar. How many times in life down, if you walked up to somebody and said, I want to borrow a quarter to get me, I don't have enough here, let me borrow a quarter. You ought to remember that. You borrowed a quarter. It wasn't given to you. If you'll be honest in the little things, you won't have so many trouble with these other things. It's the little foxes that destroy the vineyard. The little foxes. <laughs> oh, no man anything. But notice, but. There's, what's a but? A conjunction. But to do what? But to what? Love one another. How many of you still got wrote in the front of your book? Don't expect to win the world until they know we love one another supremely. He said, listen, owe no man anything but do what? But love one another. And that way you have fulfilled the what? The law. And notice what he said in the last part of verse 10. Therefore, love is the what? God has laid down a command for us that we're to do what? Love our neighbor as we what? Love ourselves. Now, folks, just stop and think about that. Do we, do we love our neighbor like we love ourselves? How many times has your neighbor gone on vacation, been gone, you looked over and his yard's growing up and you go over and mow it? You say, Brother Roy, I ain't got time. Hey, love takes time. Love has to be done by purpose. You ever looked over and saw your neighbor, his needs and all, and went over? How many of you lived in the day and the time that when a person in the community got sick and his crops was out in the field, every neighbor went together and they did everything that was to be done while that man was recovering? A little different world back then, wasn't it? See, he said, what love one another. Love one another as thy neighbor. Listen, listen. If you love one another, listen, he says, you will not do this to your neighbor. You will not do this to your fellow uh, citizens around about you. You will not do this to the people that you know and live around about you if you have this love. He said in verse number 9, he said, for this thou shall not walk. Hey, hey, listen to me. Young people get involved in premarital sex. It's not love. It's sensuality and lust. You listen to me, young girls. Any fellow say, well, I love you, I love you, I love you. 
and he goes out there and parks somewhere on a dark alley, you ought to be sure you wore a high heel that night and when his little uh, mind gets to going, you ought to take that high heel off and, and let some pressure off of his brain. Paul writing in 2 Corinthians said, when you commit fornication, it's against your own self. And I'm going to tell you something. True love waits. True love is not lasciviousness and lust. True love waits to the time of holy matrimony. He said, listen, if you love one another, you will. And by the way, if, if a man and wife loves one another, they will not go be going out committing adultery with another partner. Listen, if it, am I reading from, am I getting this from the Bible tonight? He said, listen, for this thou shalt not commit adultery, and thou shalt not what? Kill. Love forbids murder. <laughs> It's pretty hard to kill somebody in love, isn't it? Right. You've got to get angry, aren't you? You've got to get mad. You've got to let that old uh, uh, beast rise up in you. That's right. As long as you're filled with the love of God, I promise you, you'll never kill anybody intentionally. And then he goes on, he said, love forbids stealing. If we love one another, we'd never steal from one another. How many of you remember the day growing up, you didn't lock your doors, you didn't lock the chicken house, you didn't lock the ham house door, you didn't lock the, uh, the, uh, the cannon house. I mean, everybody. You didn't even lock your screen door in the summertime. Why? Didn't take from one. We respected one another, didn't 1982, I was in Israel. They kept telling us the best place in the world to get uh, trinkets to bring back home souvenirs was at, uh, at uh, Lazarus' tomb. So there's about six of us preachers, cheapskates, trying to save all the money we could. We was going to wait till we got to, uh, to Lazarus' tomb. We was going to buy all of ours to bring back. And so we got there late, and his, all the all the... Uh, trinkets is gone, all the people's gone. Us five preachers went, got back to Jerusalem, got to the hotel, we didn't have anything, so we went out. We got a taxi, we went down to the old city of Jerusalem, and we paid double what it would cost us anywhere, because the next day we're coming on. And, uh, and so uh, when we got back to our, our hotel, I paid the, uh, the taxi driver, and some way I laid my billfold down in the seat. And we went in, uh, they were getting ready to have dinner in the hotel, and I told uh, my guide, I said, uh, I left my billfold, I'm sure, in the car when I paid the text down. And this is what he said to me. He said, if an American didn't find it, you'll have it before 7 o'clock. Before 7 o'clock, the taxi driver walked in with my billfold, and it had quite a bit of money in it. I gave him a, uh, some money and all for it. Hey, wouldn't it be wonderful to live in an honest world? Huh? Time out just a moment. Can anybody give me one word that would cure the economy in America? You got it. Honesty. Honesty. How much is defrauded? Not long ago, I was at a grocery store. I, I was way, I, back over across the street. And I saw, I saw the attendants in the grocery store, the workers, throwing hams and turkeys out and putting them into a, a, a car. How much is, how much is stole at Christmas? How many of you know you pay more at Christmas for good? Because when's the shoplifting the biggest in America? Christmas. At Christmas. Do you think honesty would cure Fraud. How, much, how many of you know how much was frauded in the welfare and the social security system in, in America? $760 billion. How many of you believe your taxes would go down? Yeah. Huh? Honesty. 
I mean, wouldn't it be good to just know that everybody was truthful? You see, preacher, you're living in a fairy land. I might be living in a fairy land, but that's what God tells us we ought to be doing. He said, he said we, we should not steal. And then, then look, 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 look what he says in verse 9. He said, love forbids a false witness. Lying. There's one thing that I can't stand. Somebody lie to me. Listen, you lie to me one time, and it's going to be a long time before you get my confidence back. Not long ago, I had to get up at midnight and go do something because I promised somebody I'd do it. There's an old boy in the mountains of North Carolina years ago. I believe from all of my heart he'd climb a tree to tell you a lie before he'd stand on the ground and tell you the truth. Huh? I, I, I mean... I don't know why it is that, that, that people just, they, they, some people I know in this world, if I, I don't care what they came in here and told me not, if it was the honest truth, I could not believe them. How many of you know I've got 1,500 liars on my liars list? 1,500 probably. I've been here 11 years, and I know in 11 years that I've asked over 100 people, and they said I was going to, I'm, I'm coming to church, and they ain't been here yet. Huh? I, 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 honestly, I respect old boys and people that says, hey, I'm, I'm, I'll think about it or something, but they, they won't say I'll be there and won't be there. He, he, he said, he said in, in, in verse 9, he said, and then we're not to be in a state. If you love your neighbor, you won't covet what he's got. What's the one commandment causes you to break the other nine? The tenth one. Thy shall not what? Covet. Thy shall not what? Covet. Somebody drives in with a brand new car Sunday morning. You look out there. Oh boy, I wish there was mine. <laughs> Huh? Don't you ever once in a while? <laughs> Boy, I wish I had that. <laughs> huh? Can I give you some good advice? Be satisfied with what you got. I never will forget what I heard my dad say one day. My dad. Could have bought any ever been to the top of the Rome Mountain from Carver's Gap to the top of the mountain? My dad could have bought the whole top of the Rome Mountain. He was about 1916 or something like that. He could have bought the whole top of the Rome Mountain. He had the money. He didn't buy it. Some years later I heard this man say, Mun, if you'd have bought that, you'd have been a mold and mold and mold a millionaire. I never will forget what my dad said. He said, I've had a good bed to sleep in, good clothes to wear, and good food to eat, and God's been good to me. Why did I need any more? Man, why did I need any more? And then look at the last thing he says. Then he says, do thy neighbor know what? Harm. Love does not harm your neighbor. Love doesn't go get a jar full of fleas and take over and put in your neighbor's living room. <laughs> How many of you know there's some prayerful verses here? For this thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. If there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely what? Thy shall love thy neighbor as thyself. 
How many of you believe that'd be a prayerful thing that would happen? Start thinking about others. Start thinking about others. Well, I'm going to pull over and park for tonight. Okay? <laughs> Give you some prayer requests tonight. Sister uh, Jenny Blackwell, she had uh, some tests and all this morning, and and uh, she'll probably uh, maybe get to go home tomorrow, not not for sure. But uh, uh, lift her up in your prayers as you pray. Laureen Mullinex, she's still in a horrible state with her back. Remember Ed and Mary, son-in-law, he's... Uh, uh, he's out of the hospital now, isn't he, Ed? He's home, but he's still having a lot of difficulties. Remember him in your prayers. Uh, Lois Dillon's grandson, he, they're trying to get him into therapy somewhere, rehab. Uh, he was in a horrible accident, and it just uh, he was in a coma for about a week. But he's out of the coma now, and he comes and goes. There's times he, he knows them. Linda Turner's mother, how's she doing, Linda? Very sore. Very sore. Remember her in your prayer. Larry Bacon's mother, uh, Louise Bacon, she's in the Johnson City Medical Center. Uh, remember uh, the Watson family in uh, Bristol last Sunday night. Uh, this when I left uh, when I left uh, Beaverview, I guess he was eight years old, and uh, he was going home, had a wreck, car went into a, a pond, and he was drowned. So they had his funeral yesterday. So remember that family in your prayer. Uh, remember the tent meeting in Bristol, and two more nights. Uh, Brother Joe Arthur will be preaching on Friday night. Any of you ever hear Joe Arthur? I'd encourage you to go up and listen to Brother Joe. He's a he, uh, man. He is the one who preached that little donkey out at the campground. That little donkey. I, I, man, I tell you, I don't think I'll ever forget that message. If God can use a donkey, he can use me. Amen. Remember uh, Scott and Amy. Uh, lift them up in your prayers. Uh, Musette Sexton. Uh, Musette is just, uh, she's, unless God performs a miracle, I don't think it's going to be many more days. She's just, uh, she's uh, Dana Ferguson. Dana is probably going to go from NHC home, and uh, he'll be taking uh, some tri treatments when he gets home. Connie Tester, Connie and David were here visiting with us Sunday morning. Connie's having surgery tomorrow at the Bristol Medical uh, Hospital, Bristol Memorial Hospital. Remember Connie in your prayers. Christine uh, Fletcher, she had uh, Monday morning uh, stints. Uh, this is uh, Pam Buchanan's mother. Um, and remember this young man, uh, Scott Johnson. You remember a few weeks ago I was telling you what a battle I was having with my cable my TV and my internet. We went on vacation. Hey, listen, don't get impatient. God's working something out. And uh, we went on uh, vacation. Phyllis went over to the house, I think, three days. They never did show up, nothing. We got back. I think my wife, Monday, lost her religion. But... Uh, <laughs> but uh, this young man, Scott Johnson, he walked in today, he him another technician, and to install everything. And he said, you ain't no kin to them Yeltons in North Carolina, are you? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I happen to be. We got to talking. And he was Dan Johnson's, preacher Dan Johnson's son. And he's got out of church. 
and he and I gave him a bunch of CDs and all. We just, uh, and I, I told him, I said, you probably feel like I'm your dad standing here telling you and talking to you right now. And he said, <laughs> yeah. But pray for, pray for Scott, him and his family, three children, get back in church. He's been out of church. And uh, fine young man. So, God, I believe that was just a divine appointment for the time to come. That this might be the opportunity for 